seated. If you'll open up your bulletins for this morning's announcements. Uh, today, following our service, uh, we'll have our annual meeting, so uh, don't run off too quickly after the sermon is done. Uh, we'll have our, our bouts and a, a time for questions and answers and then for our, our vote. So, And then this afternoon, uh, we'll be meeting here at the church at 345 to go Christmas caroling. So, uh, uh, And then we'll have a, a, a supper to follow that. Uh, Saturday is the women's uh, p- pajama party over at Renee's. That, that'll be at 6 o'clock, so ladies, make sure you got that on your calendar. Okay, if you are needing a ride out there, talk to Jillian. Just put it that way. Talk to Jillian if you need a ride. So she'll coordinate that. So, And then next Sunday uh, is at 1030, the kids will be doing their uh, Christmas program. I know they've been practicing hard and working hard on that. So, And, and we do have dress rehearsal on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock for those in that, in that. Dress rehearsal Saturday. All right. I'm going to write that down before I get forget 10. All right. And then next Sunday, or the, it's December 24th, I'm sorry, we'll have normal church uh, at the nor- normal time. And then that night we will have our Christmas Eve service at 6.30. So I've uh, got several things on, on the uh, calendar, so um, make sure you check that. It's, uh, I'm going to say everything should be on the website, on the announcements, and the calendar. If you forget a time, you can go to the church, church's website and it should be listed there if you ha- happen to, to forget. So, um, Also, um, on December 12th, it will be Jeff Cox's uh, funeral over at Bethel, if you are wanting to go to that, and, or if you hadn't heard, he pa- passed away. So his service will be December 12th at Bethel. I don't have a time on that. At 10? Okay, so uh, are there any other announcements that are not in the bulletin that need to be ma- mentioned? All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for today, for this time that we could meet together to, to worship you together, to just to, Father, just to celebrate uh, this season, the, the birth of your son Jesus and what that means for us. Father, that uh, he came to, to be that sacrifice all on the cross for us so we could be reconciled, be redeemed by you. And so, Father, we're, we are so thankful for that. And, Father, help us to remember that as we celebrate Christmas this, this year. Father, I just want to lift up for those that uh, are not feeling well. Oh, Father, I just pray that, uh, well, you know what, what, what's going on in their lives. But, Father, and so, Father, we just ask that you lay your healing hand upon them. Father, we know that you know uh, you know about Amy and, and what's going on there. And Father, we just pray that you continue to be with the family and just put your healing hand on her and and help help her to get better. Be with those that are in in the hospital, just with those that are traveling, those who are hurting, going through a time where they of uh, because they've lost a loved one. Because Father, we know this is a a tough season to go through because it's you know the uh, Christmas and the New Year's and, and being the first one without a loved one can be tough. And so, Father, we pray that you just continue to wrap your loving arms around them, help them to feel your presence, help them to remember that they are loved. And Father, just uh, I just want to lift up the area of pastors and and churches as they also meet today and just be with them and speak through. Uh, those pastors and be with the, the hearers as they hear, hear your word that's, uh, as your word is pro- proclaimed today. That the, we all will just listen to what you have to say. So we can be having, we can have an, uh, an impact in the community around us. We can be that salt and light that you want us to be. So others can see you and to see the God that you are, a God of love, 
God of mercy, forgiveness, grace, compassion. And they'll see that uh, you value them. And you want what's best for, for them. And now they'll come to you to feel your presence, to feel your love, to feel your forgiveness so they can be with you for eternity. Father, I thank you for each one here, their love for you. And Father, I just pray that you continue to be with us as we continue in our services, lifting songs up to you and to read your word. That, Father, everything we do is encouraging to each other, but most importantly, Father, it brings glory and honor to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's greet each other in the name of the Lord.
Good morning, everyone. Most of us have probably seen the old movie classic, The Wizard of Oz. You know where it had Dorothy or Dog Toto and her three friends, the Scarecrow, the Lion, and the Tin Man. He said they were off to see the wizard, someone with great wisdom and authority who may be able to help them. Well, when they finally found him, they were afraid because of his because of his booming voice. I'm the great and powerful Oz. And the way he presented himself. Until Toto, the little dog, pulled back the curtain to find an old man instead of a wizard. He was just using special effects to get his point across. Jesus, on the other hand, is not fearsome or frightening even though he is great and powerful. On one occasion, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? They replied, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter spoke up, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. At communion, we remember Jesus' death on the cross, that something great and powerful was to take place. Even with the taunts of his enemies, he saves others, but he can't even save himself. They were speaking the truth. By not saving himself on the cross, Jesus provided a means for sin to be forgiven so others could be saved, something no wizard could do. Join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. At this time, we can come and remember that Christ gave himself upon the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and we, we could be made whole again. Father, we take this cup and this loaf, which represents his body and shed blood for our sins. Father, we ask this, that we'll be in the right state of mind, remembering that it was a great sacrifice that he made just for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Did uh, you hear about the older lady who was awakened by a disturbing sound in the middle of the night? She got up, she went down into her living room and uh, happened to see a burglar standing right in the middle of her room and in the living room. He was standing there and, and the phone was beside him. Well, she didn't know quite what to do then. She's face to face with this bur burglar and uh, she took a risk. She leaped for the phone and landed right next to him and she shouted, Acts 238. The burglar, burglar froze. And as he, <laughs> she said, Acts 238 again, and he stayed still and she reached around him and got the phone, called the police, and uh, he just stood there. Police come in and, and uh, said, ma'am, Mr. Burglar, why didn't you run? And uh, say, why, why didn't you run? And the old boy said, are you crazy? He said, the lady said she had an ax and two 38s. <laughs> okay. Acts 2.38 says, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. It goes on to describe, if you read on down, how the first Christians met together and, uh, and they were faithful in their stewardship. In fact, you know, they threw their money together and all, all those that believed and then they shared equally. So at that time, they, they shared. Everything that God does for us is just over the top. And uh, God created us. God redeemed us. God saves us. And God forgives us. So the gift he's giving us and, uh, is over the top, isn't it? And this morning, we continue our worship with our giving of the, our tithes and offerings. And uh, we need to think about uh, what he's given us. And then we give back a portion to him. Would you go with me in prayer? Father God in heaven, we just thank you, Father, for this morning. We're thankful, Father, for, for uh, everything that's happened so far, for the music, for the songs, for the, the time uh, to meet you around the table, and now time to give back a portion of what you've given us. Father, I just pray that you'd be with us as we do that. You would bless each one that partakes of these emblems. Uh, be with Heath as he brings a message this morning, and just guide and direct us. Father, we just ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
the kids are dismissed for Children's Church and, and the Low Explorers. You want to open your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 2. That's where we're, we're going to begin as we continue in our series on the gift of Jesus. Today we're going to take a look at the gift that redeems. So let, before we dive in, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for today, for this time to gather together as church family, to worship you. To not only sing praises to you, but also to read your word. So, Father, I pray that you open our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts, so you can, we can take what you're saying to us today. Take it from our heads to our hearts to our hands, to apply it to our lives so others can see you, to see you the way we do, as a God who is loving caring, forgiving, and merciful. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Christmas is a very busy time of the year. I mean, just think about all the things you got to do. There are declarations uh, to put up. There's bright lights to hang. There's Christmas caroling, which we're going to do this afternoon, and there's always the uh, family gatherings. And I don't know how many you have, but I'm pretty sure we have at least two, if not three, that we got to be a part of later on this month. There's also other church and school activities that you got to uh, attend to, not a, not also probably even some work Christmas par parties to be at. And in just even thinking about it, it can wear you out. In fact, one woman, uh, she waited until the last minute to send out her Christmas card. She had 49 cards that she needed to send out. And so one evening she, she didn't have them and she needed to send them out, out, out to the next day. So she rushed into a store. She found a package of 50 cards. She didn't even bother to look and see what uh, it said in the card. Uh, she got home. She uh, addressed them, stuffed them, and put a stamp on them and put them in the mailbox. And on Christmas Day, a few days later, when she had some time to herself, she sat out at the table and she happened to see one of the card, the leftover card that she didn't need to send out. And so she finally picked it up, took a look at it, and this is what the card said. This is a card just to say, a little gift is on the way. Man, I would have loved to have seen the faces that she had on, or the look on, on her face. She, when she realized she had 49 friends expecting a gift that would never come. I wonder if anyone called her up and asked her if she was pregnant. <laughs> she was in such a to, uh, hurry to, that, that she didn't even take the time to read the Christmas card. To know what it was, what she was sending and saying to her friends. But in contrast, God spent centuries telling His people about the gift that He intended to send them. In fact, He uh, He described this gift in detail. Over three hundred prophecies uh, are uh, were used to describe who this gift is and what this gift was going to be. And when Jesus did show up, the prophetess knew exactly who he was. In fact, we can read about her, read about in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. And here's what Luke wrote. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped day and night and fasting and praying. 
And coming up to them, Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. This child that Mary had in her arms that day that she was carrying was born. Jesus was born to bring redemption. Redemption not just to Israel, but to, for everybody. In fact, it's a repeated theme throughout the entire New Testament. That Jesus is repeatedly referred to as the one who would redeem us. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Paul says in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that, his ver that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Paul declares in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, For he, God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Now these words redeem and redemption are interesting. But what does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus needed, needed to redeem us? My first thought is that it means that Jesus' blood has bought us. And while that's true, I believe there's more to that. And to help us to understand the concept of redemption, I, I, I have a story for you. There was a boy named Tom, and him and his uh, father uh, built a small boat together. It, it took uh, quite a long time uh, to build it, but when it was finished, it was absolutely beautiful. And Tom could hardly wait to, get, to take it out and put it on the river. And on one wonderful spring day, he took his toy boat down to the river. And before he put it in the water, he tied a string to it and, caref and then carefully placed it in the water. And the boat uh, looked almost real as it floated on the river, but Suddenly, a, a strong current caught the boat, and, and as pa Tom tried to pull the boat back to shore, the string broke. And so the little boat raced downstream with Tom chasing after it as fast as he could go. In fact, he spent the rest of the day looking for it because it had slipped out of his sight. He kept looking until it was too dark to see, and Tom sadly went home. Now a few days later on the way home from school, Tom happened to spot a, a boat that was looked just like his in a store window. And when he got up to the window to look at it, sure enough, it was his boat. So he hurried into the store. He found the manager and said, sir, the boat that you have in the toy boat that you have in your window, that's my boat. I made it. But the manager said, I'm sorry, son, but uh, somebody brought it in this morning, so if you want it, you have to buy it. So Tom took a look at the price of the boat, and he ran home, and he counted it out and discovered it was going to take all the money he had. And when he had gathered all the money he had, he hurried back to the store, and he bought his toy boat. And as he really walked out the store, he hugged his boat, and he said, now you're twice mine. First I made you, and now I've bought you. So what does that story tell us about redemption? Redemption literally means to buy something back. You see, it belonged to you, but for whatever reason, you had to redeem it or buy it back. And that's what the, this little boy had done. He had owned that toy boat but because it got away and he found it in a store because somebody sold it to the store, he had to buy it or redeem it to get it back. Now, pawn shops do this 
all the time. You, know, you can take an item, if, if, if you're hard up for cash and need a little extra money, you can take an item in like a watch or a, a, a TV or something and, and sell it to them and get some, uh, the, the cash for it. And you have a, a limited amount of time that you can go back to the pawn shop and redeem it, buy it back at the pawn price plus interest. And that's what it means to us. You see, God God made you. You were made in his image. You literally belonged to God. The thing is, is if someone doesn't understand that truth, that they were made in the image of God, they often tend to have an idea that they are not worth very much. I think for most of us, we know, most of us, I think, can remember the, the movie It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, right? It's a classic. And in the movie, Stewart's character tries to trade his life insurance policy. But the problem is, like all life insurance policies, it's not worth anything until the person dies. Well, Jimmy Stewart's character, his arch enemy, gives him an evil grin and tells, looks at him and says, hey, Looks like you're worth more dead than alive. You see, without knowing God created you, that's what some people may think. They may think that they're worth more dead than alive because that's where it shows on their life insurance policy. See, the theory of evolution teaches that you and I are accidents of nature that we have no inherent value or purpose according to evolution because we are a result of uh, unfocused interactions of matter. And as far as having any intrinsic value, evolution says you have none. Evolution teaches that you are essentially no different from a, a frog, a tree, or a piece of moss. Because according to evolution, all of us are just a collection of mindless molecules. But the thing is, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you are valuable. You do have a purpose. And you have a reason to exist. All that's true. Because God thought that you were worth his time. He created you. He made you in his image. You, have incre- uh, you are far more valuable than anything else on earth. In fact, you are his masterpiece. I mean, let's just look at Genesis 1.27 and see what God says, uh, to what Scripture says. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In Genesis 2, 7, it continues, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. You have value because you were created in the image of God. He created you differently than anything else he created. We're the only ones that he breathed the breath of life into. Alan Webster once said, evolution sees you as, the, as one step above the apes, but scripture sees you as one step beneath the angels. So we need to remember that we were created in God's image. God made us. He owned us. We were his treasured possession. But then there's something happened. Something went wrong. And how would God, who made us, lose us? What went wrong for this to happen? That's sin. You see, God formed us, but sin has deformed us. Sin has robbed us of our relationship to God. Romans 6, 23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death. You see, our sin... Our sin has condemned us to an eternity without God. 
So if God is going to get us back, he needs, he needs to buy us back. He would need to redeem us. In fact, that was recognized all the way back in the Old Testament. In fact, Job declared in Job 19.25 where he says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. God's plan was to be our Redeemer. And all through the Old Testament, God has pointed to that truth because we can't redeem ourselves. The thing is, is how was God going to do that? How is he going to buy us back? How is he going to redeem us? Well, Paul explains this to us in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Paul says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God made you also an heir. So that's why Jesus was born. Born of a woman. Born under the law. He was born God in the flesh to be our redeemer, to be the one who would buy us back. Because remember, God formed us, sin deformed us, but Jesus transforms us. The question is, when did that, when did that happen? When did Jesus redeem us? Was it when he was born and laid in a manger? Was that when he redeemed us? No. Paul says in Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Where was Jesus hung on a tree? He was hung on a tree when he, rede- uh, uh, when he died on the cross. At Calvary, Jesus paid for our sins. He paid for us by dying on the cross for us. You see, we deserve to die because we can't pay the price to redeem ourselves. But Jesus took our place. There's a meme on Facebook one time that explained why Jesus came to die. And here's what it says. If he had not come, this babe in the manger, if God had not loved, restraining his anger, I would be lost, forever a stranger. But God so loved, Jesus so died, and I so live. Most of us have grown up in the church most or all of our lives. And we know how Jesus redeemed us. We hear the story regularly because it is the basic gospel message. But the question is, does it matter to you? We've heard the the gospel message for most of our lives and we're used to hearing it, but does it still matter to you? How does it feel when you hear the gospel message? You know, it's possible that after hearing a message over and over again that we can get calloused and get to the point where we don't take it seriously. There's a chance we might come to church Sunday after Sunday and not really give it a, a second thought. We all have know what a gift card is, and you've probably bought one at one time or have received one and and because of the fact that we a lot of times give them as gifts or have received them as one. 
And I, the thing about a gift card is, is you can put some money on a gift card and then you have to take it to the store to redeem the cash. To, you have to buy something and, and it's so, uh, so you can get that item by using the, getting the money off of that card. And a pastor once shared a, an experience uh, that he had with his gift card. And I want to share that with us this morning because I think it fits. He says that he took his sister Donna to, out to eat for Thanksgiving one year. And he took her to Applebee's. And as they drove up, he saw on their marquee that if you bought a $50 gift card, you could receive a $10 bonus card for free. So he, did, so he bought one. Thing is, is that day they wouldn't let him use the $10 bonus card that day. So he put the meal on the, the regular gift card, uh, the $50 gift card that he bought just moments before that. A week later, he went back to Applebee's to, uh, to, so he could use uh, uh, the, the bonus card. And so when he went to pay, uh, he used the bonus card first, and then he, he paid with the rest of the, the gift card. And, and it came out to be that he had $10 left on his gift card. Well, he put his coat on, and, and then he walked out of the restaurant. He was in his car, and he was 10 blocks away when he realized that he had left his gift card on the table at Applebee's. So he turned around, he went back, and he looked for it, but it, the table had already been cleaned off, so he found a, a waitress there. They got, In fact, they got the, the waitress that cleaned the table off, and he told her what happened, and she says, well, I'm sorry that happened to you. Let me go look and see, and she even looked in the trash, but she couldn't find it anywhere. He had lost it. He shared that he felt really bad about it. I mean, he'd lost $10. He said, I consoled myself with the knowledge that it was just $10. That was the value of the bonus card that I got when I had paid for the $50 card. He says, I, got, I paid $50 and got $50 worth of food from Applebee's. I got what I paid for. So I didn't feel too bad. I just felt stupid, he said, because it really didn't cost him anything. So it really didn't matter all that much to him. I think the same thing can happen to us as Christians. Christ's gift on the cross cost Jesus everything. But it hasn't cost us anything. And because it doesn't cost us anything, we might be tempted over time to not consider it all that important. So the question is, is so how can we make sure that that doesn't happen to us? That we just take it for granted or that it's not all that important to us? We've got to find a way to remember what Christ did for us. And that's what communion is all about. Communion was created was established to help us to remember what Christ did for us, the cost of our sin to be forgiven. We're told in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26, this is what Paul says. He says, For I have received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, this after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's why here at First Christian Church, we take communion every week so we don't forget it's vital that we never forget what Jesus did on the cross for us because we aren't good enough worthy to be able to buy our forgiveness because we aren't perfect we have sin in our life Jesus was the only one who could pay the price to buy us back to redeem us 
And we need to remember that. Because just like the, the people of Israel, if you want to, they needed a reminder constantly on who God was and what he had done for them. And if, they, if you don't think they ever forgot, read the book of Joshua. Read the book of Judges. They forgot on a regular basis of what God had done for them. If you, you could even read uh, sooner than that when, when God delivered them from Egypt, how often they forgot that he was the one that led them out of Egypt. We need to remember what Christ did for us. That if he had not come, this baby in a manger, if God had not loved, restraining his anger, his anger, I would be lost forever a stranger. But God so loved, Jesus so died, and I so lived. I hope that this year during Christmas, as you celebrate Christmas, that we remember that Jesus was born to be our Redeemer. Because that's what Christmas is all about. Without Jesus being born, there would be no cross, and there would be no resurrection. And without the cross, there would just be another baby being born. And without the resurrection, we wouldn't have victory over sin and death. So let's remember, it took Jesus being born. His purpose of being born was to redeem us from our sin. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being an all-knowing God. A God that when he, you created mankind, you knew what was going to happen. That we were going we to mess up. We were going to mess up your plan. So you had an answer for it. And that answer was Jesus. You were going to send him to earth to be born by, by a woman under the law and become a curse for us, to be cru crucified on the cross for our sins so we can be redeemed and brought back to you. So, fathers, we celebrate Christmas. Help us to remember we are celebrating our Redeemer. That's your son, Jesus. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.
You may be seated.